Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so talk of AI is everywhere. I don't know if AI is everywhere, but the talk about it is. Uh, we talked about it this morning at a breakfast panel. And uh, you know, investment in AI is ballooning. Uh, most companies, even if they're not implementing it yet or thinking about implementing it, uh, we're lucky to have some executives here who are uh, doing some aggressive uh, implementation of AI and, and have some interesting experiences to talk about to, to give us some examples of how it can be applied, as Alan said, in a variety of businesses. Uh, Lori Beer, who's the CIO of J.P. Morgan Chase and manages some 50,000 technologists, which is kind of a mind-blowing stat. Uh, Justin Kershaw, the CIO of Cargill, and uh, he's been with the company for about six years now, and, and Farhan Siddiqui, the Chief Digital Officer of McDonald's. Um, Lori, I'm going to start with you. You've been at J.P. Morgan Chase for about four years, right? Uh, I'm curious, just when you got to the company, was there AI at J.P. Morgan Chase? You know, how much has it changed in that period of time? Yeah, so I think you know AI has been around for some time, and just if you think about some of our businesses, which are very algorithmic, we've had machine learning for some time. And so really, um, it was a bit embedded in our business. We also had launched some proof of concepts um, around many different things. I think where we're transforming to is how we do this, how we do AI at scale. How do we truly become an AI-driven company? And that is what we're thinking about changing now. So that goes back to how do we really set up a structure? How do we leverage the critical resources we need to do that? And what are the real business problems we're trying to solve so that you get AI value and you get that at scale? Yeah, I think you eloquently addressed something which is, you know, we just throw around AI like it just came out of the sky. AI appeared last year and now we're all gonna have to use it. But it's really like building more sophisticated systems on top of, you know, more advanced technology on top of a lot of things you're already kind of doing. But, you know, with a company like J.P. Morgan Chase, you have millions of customers, gazillions of transactions. Uh, when you look across the whole enterprise, how do you think about how to target the technology and where you can, you know, add the most value now and, and, and going forward? For us, it, it's, it starts with a premise of how can we serve our customers and create the experiences they want. So engaging with our customers and whether it's through our channels or through parties, third parties, as we're seeing with uh, virtual assistants and Alexa and, and all of those products and having to think about new ways customers want to engage with us. With the amount and volume of customers and clients we do have, being able to do personalization at scale. And so really catering to the need. And then offering our customers as they want to think about their financial products and their financial security, what are the next best products? And who are the next customers? So really focusing on how does it create the client customer experiences we want, new sources of revenue. And if you think about our business, it's a business of trust. So we have to be best in class when you think about using AI around things like cybersecurity and all the processes around money movement, whether you think about sanctions or any money laundering or fraud. So for us, a lot of focus around how we engage with our customers, how we protect our customers, how we think about using AI and transforming what we even think about a product. And of course, we can't forget about our employees. And how do we really bring them the intelligence they need to keep up with the pace of change in today's world? Just to ask you about one of those things, you mentioned uh, virtual assistant. Um, you know, we're all, uh, probably everybody in the room here is experienced in Alexa or Google Home or something, and we've certainly all you know, called up and gotten the voicemail and dealt with a, <laughs> an automated system that maybe, maybe we uh, enjoyed or didn't. But so I, I know this summer you, you announced an AI-powered uh, virtual assistant pilot program for your treasury services business, which moves like $5 trillion around per day. Uh, maybe just give us like a window into what it took to, imp to create that kind of system, you know, using AI. I think what's important when you go from, you know, having proof of concepts to validate technology to doing it at enterprise scale, it comes from thinking about um, what's the best way to leverage that? What's the best way to leverage your critical human capital in addition to the capital um, you know, for infrastructure and all those other components. So for us, we thought about, from an analytics perspective, what's the problem we're trying to solve? We have that component deeply embedded in our businesses, and they're coming up, and in this case, Treasury Services coming up with what are the unique ways we want to engage with our customers today and in, into the future. 
Um, so that's one component. That's linked into, as we think about the core patterns, whether it's speech recognition or natural language processing, having deep resources that truly understand those capabilities and doing those across the firm. So if you think about even personalization at scale, whether I'm talking about the Chase digital assets or JP Morgan markets, they're different customers, a consumer versus a client, and they may be different user experiences, but embedded in terms of how we think about delivering that personalization, getting that firm-wide leverage. So it starts with how to, what are the business problems we're trying to solve, make sure our data scientists are truly embedded in the business, how we get leverage of those deep resources that truly understand the technical capabilities, how do we build the technology frameworks. So if you think about virtual assistant, we're building some of those core capabilities that are leverageable, whether I'm thinking about my internal IT help desk or I'm thinking about new ways to expose that to the clients. And the final two layers around infrastructure, how do I optimize the infrastructure I need to support mm -hmm. that? And then the data. Of course, we can't forget about the data. Never forget about the data. <laughs> the AI will not forget about the data. Uh, Justin, let's turn to you real quick. Cargill is one of the world's largest private companies, over $100 million in sales, very global, you know, global food supply chain. I think you, you mentioned that it, you touched something like 20% of the global food supply chain. That's right. Um, trade commodities, it's interesting uh, that it's still a family controlled business essentially too, to be such a large scale global business. Um, so how do you, what's your philosophy about how to apply AI systems to that kind of set of businesses? The food supply business, trading business. How are you implementing this technology? Everything we think about in terms of technology and how we are applying AI, machine learning, and, and all of uh, the advancements is we think about technology with a purpose. And, uh, and that gets broken into th three main um, parts. So essentially Cargill is the commercialization of photosynthesis, right? So we go to the origination hmm. of food and we're applying with farmers for, uh, you know, to help them with their farmer livelihood, farm management. Um, new systems and new technology. So we're, we're thinking of that end of the, of the chain. And then we'll move all the way up to um, folks like McDonald's and, uh, and all of our great customers like McDonald's and how we can apply um, the information we have on the food supply. You guys do a lot of egg business together, we do a, right? A lot of, we struck a, lot a deal business. yesterday, by the way. Yeah, I, <laughs> Cargill does a lot of business with both these two, so I'm yeah. sitting in the perfect spot. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we really try and uh, apply it to uh, up the chain of, of, of the destination of the food as well. And then the, th and then the third place is, uh, is internal in our supply chain. And we have you know, one of the largest, most complicated supply chains in the world. And, and, um, and we understand how food moves and where it moves and when it moves and, um, and all of those things. So, so we're, uh, we're doing it in those three areas. And, uh, and that's, it's the, the purpose is to um, you know, be the world leader in nourishing the world. So all of the things we do are towards doing it more efficiently, effectively, lower costs, lower emissions, more sustainability. Um, it's really not a story of technology for technology's sake. It's really a story with, driven through the purpose of what we're trying to achieve. I got to ask you about two interesting examples. AI for cows and AI for shrimp. How about okay. it? How about it? You've got Shrimp it's, make a sound when they eat. Yeah, you've got a software system that listens to the shrimp while they're eating, which sounds a little creepy, but I, and I didn't even know shrimp made noise when they were eating. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, and you've, you've invested in a startup that has facial recognition technology for cows. So explain how yeah. AI apply, I mean, looking at cows is relaxing and interesting. I love cows, but how do you apply AI to looking at cows' faces and listening to shrimp while they're having dinner? Uh, so both of those are great examples of, of uh, how we're focused on farmer livelihood. Both of those are to make the farmers uh, more effective in, uh, in uh, producing their product and, uh, and, and help them uh, earn more value. So those are two platform examples of a business. So in, uh, in the reference to the shrimp, you know, shrimp farms, shrimps are farmed along, uh, it's a warm water species. And um, so I think India produces about 17% of the world's shrimp, and they also have it other places along the equator. And, uh, and they, it's farmed in ponds, and the ponds take management, and, and uh, very, um, you know, people with pieces of paper paddling around in the, 
in the um, ponds to farm the shrimp and, and throwing the food. And, you know, there's a lot of efficiency to be gained there. So with an IoT device and capturing the sound, we found that uh, shrimp make a sound when they eat. And you don't want to feed them um, when they're not hungry. And you want to feed them when they are hungry. And you want to stop feeding them. Right? So that's another good example of disruption inside our own company because we also sell the shrimp farmers the feed. So the feed guys who invoice on pounds of feed aren't so excited when the they want to fatten up the shrimp. Yeah, well, I mean, and uh, and you want to do it the right way and yeah. and uh, and keep the water as clean as possible to raise a healthier product. And, and in reference to the to the um, cows, the heifers, um, you know, you can learn a lot about a cow by um, how she moves, how often she moves, when she eats, uh, what her face is saying, and uh, and so in dairy production, keeping um, you know the rotation of your of your cows um, at pregnant and inseminated at the right time and the right success rate. Success rates are pretty low, and if you can raise those success rates, you provide a lot of efficiency to that farmer, and and so facial recognition and AI and um, is providing us the opportunity to put uh, solutions out there for farmers that are not afraid of the technology to be a lot more effective and make a better product, um, use less resources, and uh, you know, maybe get an hour off a week. Farming is a, is a tough job, right? And Nonstop. Yeah, one thing you know when you, when you look a farmer in the eye, and I've, you know, we've all done a lot of that in Cargill, is you know, when you're bringing them technology, the last thing they want is one more thing that's going to break on their farm that they can fix. <laughs> right. so, um, they want someone on their side who understands that and brings them something that actually can help them be more productive, and that's what we're doing. Great. So Farhan, McDonald's uh, is another global business. You have thousands of restaurants around 120 countries. You have franchisees, you know, millions of transactions, millions of Big Macs. Uh, Billions. Billions. Billions of Big Macs. I know you can't talk in too much specific, because some of what you're doing is in stealth mode, I guess, but how, what's your general uh, approach to coming to McDonald's and thinking about how to apply this new technology to this restaurant, this global restaurant business? Sure. Um, McDonald's, I mean, like you talked about thousands of restaurants, about 37,000 restaurants in over 100 countries, serve about 70 million uh, customers on a daily basis. Um, so one of the big assets we have, we're, we're everywhere, we're ubiquitous. But the concept of ubiquitous is changing because it is like the physical and digital, wherever the customer is, it's not about an impulse buy and when they come to you. So when you think about that, um, I mean, the digital platforms allow us to meet the customers where they are, whether they're in their home or the office, and even with the cars, connected cars, autonomous cars on the go too. So what we think about is how are consumers engaging with the brands, whether it's for brand engagement, whether it's for commerce, whether it's for service. Lori talked about service and chatbots. I mean, that's a very obvious one, okay? People expect you to engage with them with those. Um, in the marketing side, obviously, personalization is another thing you talked about. There's a huge opportunity of like knowing your customer and personalizing those experiences at a, at a, you know, a hyper personalization for mass uh, populations. Those are the obvious ones. Commerce is a very interesting one for us to pay attention to because if you think about commerce, we are already conversational. People talk and speak their order and it's very contextual, it's very complicated, it's not a single instruction commerce that happens. We introduced digital platforms for self-service, but the human-machine interfaces are going back to conversational, so um, it is more human-like, both the interfaces. When you pay attention to that, it is very, very relevant to us. Whether it's in the home, whether it's your smart speaker, whether it's in the car, which might be more of a conversational interface, um, or, or anything else that it goes to, chat platforms, whether it's speech or uh, typing. So that is very relevant for us. And when you start double clicking to the layers that are required to make that happen, it is very much okay. Smart engines, algorithmic decisions, natural language processing, all those things come into play. So that's why it's very, very relevant for us. So you're talking, uh, it sounds to me like you're talking a lot about the customer experience and evolving that and, and adding this technology in and, and allowing um, self-service components to, to complement what you're doing with your employees now. How far out is that? Because those sound like very complicated systems, as you're saying, to, to implement into the real world over time. I think, like anything, there's going to be a roadmap. There's going to be uh, variations of the 
capabilities that you build, you start very simple, and then as like technology and your capabilities are sophisticated, will get more sophisticated. One of the early learnings for us was um, learning how people order McDonald's. We have, actually have our own language. Once you look at it, okay, yeah. how people order not only dialects, um, what the products are, within the US you have very, a lot of combinations, and you go across the world, the permutations become really, really big. So, so some of the current technologies probably won't be able to solve our uh, problem anytime soon. So, but we still have to be in the game to learn and shape where the industry goes with some of these solutions. Great. Um, if we have questions, please raise your hand and we'll get you a paddle. Um, I want to ask a little bit about the challenges to this, uh, to implementing AI. You know, we hear a lot that the biggest challenge is it's, it's more of a people problem than a technology problem. The technology is, is humming along and you have to figure out how to have the right people to do this. And I think that, that there's two buckets that I see, basic, basic buckets of, you know, having the right types of employees, maybe the analytics experts, data specialists, and then also retraining your workforce to use the technology. So I'd like to just hear from each of you, you know, as you look at your companies and, and implementing this, what are the challenges? How do you think about surmounting these challenges? Yeah, I think one of the first things, starting with talent, is being very focused, having a strategy. So when you're going to implement this, um, Again, the, everybody talks about needing data scientists, but what are the real problems we're trying to solve? We've got that community, even though there's different businesses, coming together, sharing ideas, and looking at, and it's a really important point, that some of the technologies that are out there aren't necessarily tuned to support the financial services industry either. That's then when we needed to tap into research. So we hired a, a talent, Manuela Velosa, who he headed up machine learning at uh, Carnegie Mellon to help us tap into research because it's important to us not only that we mature the capabilities to support financial services, but that we really address the bias issues, the explainability, and some of the other challenges we have to face. In our world, everything can't just be a black box. We have to be able to explain what's happening behind the technology. So really tapping into that, and also to further emphasize the point, how do we tap into the ecosystem of emerging tech to help mature these capabilities as well? Then when we get to um, our own engineers, how do we build some of the frameworks that they can focus on that integration, the human computer integration? So in many of our cases, it's insights. The point in time that a trader is trying to do a request for, co for a quote for a client, making sure they have that, those insights have to be deeply integrated into the workflow. So we need our engineers to understand their data, the mm. systems, and how to integrate that technology, and then building out the framework so we get that leverageability. And we've brought in some talent, Aporo Saxena join us from Google, and he's building out a team that is allowing us to build the reusable components. So this aligned with our strategy allows us to think about where do we need talent, how do we leverage our internal talent, those that have the deep domain knowledge and expertise, and bring in some new talent to tap into those ecosystems while we also evolve some of the other challenges we'll face driving this to scale around understandability or explainability, the, the, the bias and the data, and uh, again, really driving this forward with the tech ecosystem as well. Justin Farhan, are you, are you I think doing we have a lot a of question hiring? in the audience if you want to grab. Oh, okay, we got a, a question back here. Just uh, remember to identify yourself. Uh, good morning, Randy Mickey with Informatica. There's a lot of opportunity, also a lot of challenges with data AI. Curious in terms of roadmap, I think Farhan, you mentioned roadmap. What are the principles or some of the key lessons learned and how to prioritize and order things when you look at a roadmap? Not to tackle everything at once, but to do things in a logical order. Good question. I'm going to take you that. You guys want to take it? I think focus on the business first and uh, prove out that's something that's closer uh, to your current business model and you prove out the value of that and then you get actually a lot of buy-in from the rest of the company when you can prove economic value. If you focus on the shiny objects, you can get lost. So once you prove out that you can drive the core business with these new technologies and new value propositions, you get the liberty to go for the differentiators and innovation and then you can experiment with those. That's the approach we take. Yeah, yeah, related. Did you well, no, I, I would, I'll just add a uh, great answer. And, and uh, again, that goes back to our, our three ways. Um, so we go up the chain to, the, to our customers and figure out what they care about and focus on that, that data. What questions are they trying to answer? What questions can we answer for them and focus on that data? And then back to the origination, same thing at the origination end of food. And then inside the supply chain, 
It's, uh, it's the fundamentals, it's master data, it's, it's, it, what, it's what moves, it's the digital meets physical, and how good is that data, and the better that data is, the less friction there is in moving it, and we've been focusing an awful lot on that. I think that's just one thing to add to that, because I think they hit a lot of the key points, but building the workbenches out for the data scientists to drive that efficiency and to find those new insights um, is one dimension of it. But given, like for us, a company over 200 years that grew up out of 1,200 plus companies, mm -hmm. really focusing while we're advancing these capabilities, not losing sight of that data, this great rich data that we have, mm -hmm. um, we may not be using it today, but we have to continue to advance and mature how we think about our data broadly because they may be insights and data we need in the future. Yeah. And that's another critical component. Maybe the AI can remind you about some pool of data <laughs> you forgot about. Okay, we have another question over here. Good morning. My name is Jack Crow. I'm the executive director of Year Up Chicago, a workforce not for profit. I wonder how you think about the talent pipeline in AI and cybersecurity, and how do you attract a diverse workforce that maybe will be able to root out some of the biases we've heard talked about in AI? You want to start? Well, sure. Uh, well, you start with um, with declaring at a, at a very senior level that inclusion and diversity. Is a, is a major, and uh, I would say not an initiative, but it's a it's a purpose, it's a it's a principle, it's um, and take it to another level, and that's one thing we've done in Cargill. Our CEO has said um, three priorities: one, safety; number one, uh, we do a lot of dangerous things in a lot of dangerous places; two, inclusion and diversity; and third, becoming a, a technology-driven organization and lead our industry uh, in technology. And, uh, and then you hit the road and, um, and you, you recruit talent from places. You go places and you, and you make yourself proximate in places where you've never been. And, um, and, you, en and you engage the, the folks looking for work and, and try and change your workforce. And in the technology organization in the last four and a half years, we, we changed by strategic choice 70% um, of our workforce. So uh, my team, went from uh, being mostly male-led to now more than half of the CIOs in Cargill that work on our team and our large businesses are all women. And, um, and we're, we're, uh, we're staffing and orging uh, outside the United States uh, for technology like, like we never have in the past. And it's, it's, uh, it's completely changed how we, uh, how we succeed and, and, and the results we're getting. It's, yeah, go ahead, Lori. I was just going to say, of, of course, we focus on making sure we're building a, a diverse workforce on the inside in many different ways. I think it's also incumbent upon companies to think about how do we help build the workforce of the future? How do we help people, parents, kids, the influencers of kids? What are the jobs of the future? And so that's where I think we have to, we, we've all, I think, been looking at non-traditional ways of getting tech talent in, in the door. We have a program, just one example, called Tech Connect where we take folks that don't have a technology degree, but they demonstrate the aptitude and we put them through a coding boot camp. Then they join in with our new entry level. And so far, it's really promising. By the way, that group is mostly diverse, um, many, many representations. And so far, that group, while it's still a small pool in the overall, is performing at the same level of those that have come through the traditional path. So I think whether it's the code for good work that we do, many programs that many companies support, I think it's incumbent that we not only work at the university level, but in our communities, and really helping um, build what the jobs and the workforce of the future are and how we help enable those by supporting those programs. Farhan, did you want to quickly build on that? Yeah, I'll just build on what Laurie was talking about. Uh, it's a multi-pronged approach. I mean, you have all these, you know, um, toolkits, you know, tools in your toolkit that are available, and let's not forget, okay, we'll not be able to hire every single skill set fast enough to compete and where we need to go. So you gotta be open. And uh, the good thing about McDonald's is uh, people are really willing to work with you, whether it's startups, whether it's VCs, whether it's universities, leverage all of them to bring the, you know, the right talent and mix it up. Uh, but you can create an environment, it doesn't really matter where they, which company they work for, where they come from, and they're working with your workforce and training them while it's happening. So that works out really well. But uh, the other thing I found really valuable is when you have these neat initiatives and you can get engaged with some of the universities, it's a, you know, it's a multi-fold benefit of that. Not only getting, you're getting a good project done, you're supporting the community, you're creating a recruiting pipeline because you're signaling to them that there's some really neat stuff going on over here. It's not only in the valley. So that helps quite a bit too. 
Great. Well, three great case studies. Thank you, Farhan, Justin, and Lori, and join me in thanking Thank our you. panelists. Thank you. Thank you.